Hello everyone, welcome to Clearwater Marine Aquarium's virtual field trip series. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Now our first series is going to be all about sea turtles. And our first episode is going to be greens, kemps, and loggerheads, oh my. We're going to talk to you guys all about the five different species of sea turtles that we see here in Florida. So my name is Lindsay and I'm a marine biologist and an educator here at Clearwater Marine Aquarium. And today I'm going to be joined with my other marine biologist and educator staff, Caitlin and Taylor. And we're going to tell you guys all about sea turtles. So out of the seven species of sea turtles in the whole world, Florida is lucky enough to have five out of the seven. So we're going to talk about each species that we have here and show you some of our residents of those species. The first one that I want to talk to you guys about today is our loggerhead sea turtle. This is an example of a loggerhead sea turtle skull. So as you can see, it's really big, and that's actually how they get their names. So loggerheads have big block-like heads, hence the name loggerhead. Now loggerhead turtles are the most common out of all the turtles here in Florida, and they're pretty big. Adults can average about 275 pounds, which is pretty big. They also have two claws on their front flippers, which they can use when they're on land. Um, and that's pretty common of most sea turtles to have claws in their flippers, but we'll talk more about that in the anatomy lesson. So loggerheads have a big difference between males and females as an adult. The males have longer tails and the females have shorter tails. Loggerheads also have a very powerful jaw and they can use that jaw to crunch on crabs or other crustaceans that have harder shells. Now let's go take a look at our resident loggerhead sea turtle snorka, Snorkel with Taylor and Emma. Hey everyone, we are here at Turtle Bayou learning about one of our resident loggerhead sea turtles, uh, Snorkel here. We're going to be learning all about Snorkel and her story from one of our sea turtle biologists, Emma. So hi Emma. Hi Taylor. So we're here with Snorkel. Snorkel is just like Taylor said, one of our loggerhead sea turtles. She is really special as one of our residents. She is actually missing both her eyeballs, portions of her top jaw, and also her nostrils or her nares. Now, Snorkel's story, again, is very special. We don't know exactly what happened to her. Sea turtles, as hatchlings, their goal is to make it from their nest up in the sand out into the water to a place called the sargasm or the weed line. And that's where they spend a couple years until they're a little bit bigger, and then they will swim around the ocean as normal. Um, now sometimes sea turtles are not strong enough and they get washed back to the sand so that is what's called a washback hatchling. Snorkel was one of those hatchlings and when she was found she was found with all these facial deformities. So as a loggerhead sea turtle today we're going to do her training session. She's going to be getting different types of meat. So here you can see she's getting some squid and shrimp and clam and all sorts of yummy meats that carnivores would be eating. Uh, so snorkel as a loggerhead sea turtle out in the ocean she would be eating hard shelled things so they have very powerful jaws um, but because she is missing portions of her jaw we give her these softer meats um, so today lauren one of our other sea turtle biologists is going to go ahead and start her training session here Working with snorkel is a little bit different because of those challenges we talked about. So missing her eyes, missing portions of her jaw, we feed her a little bit differently. So with our resident sea turtles, we're going to work with them all on a case-by-case -case basis to give him, them the very best care that we can. Um, with snorkel, her training session works, we take this little baton here that Lauren is holding and we tap it three times against the wall. Now what we expect from that tap is snorkel is going to come up out of the water ready to eat with her mouth open. And we're going to use these little forceps right here to feed her those different types of meat. Now, Snorkel has been here for a little bit over a year. We celebrated her rescue anniversary in November. And she is about three years old. So she's still a juvenile loggerhead sea turtle. Still pretty small, but during this time she has already grown. She's about 30 pounds, but loggerhead sea turtles can get anywhere from 3 to 400 pounds. So they're a very large turtle, the third largest species of sea turtle in the world, which is pretty neat. Um, something really cool about having a loggerhead sea turtle as a resident here at Clearwater Marine Aquarium is th this is a species that will be nesting out on our beaches here during nesting season, which is May through October. So that's coming up. We're really excited about that. We have a nesting team that is dedicated to patrolling our beaches here in Clearwater and looking for those nests and making sure that these animals are nice and safe. 
So this is a great example of a loggerhead. She is our only resident loggerhead. Now what you see Lauren doing right now is called tactile. So this is Snorkel's end of session cue. Her beginning of session cue was that auditory cue tapping on the wall. End of session is rubbing that back portion of her carapace, which is her back shell. And then she knows there's no more food and we're not expecting her to reach up with her mouth open for more food. So that's how snorkel session works. Again, it's different than our other animals and she has already improved a great deal. During these feeding sessions, we're looking for her to be very calm. Um, a lot of times we are also incorporating different types of tactile. So sometimes we will work on pairing a piece of food with touching her plastron, which is that underside of her body, or touching near her flippers. Again, she's a resident CT turtle so she will be here for the rest of her life and we want to give her the very best care so every time that we have to pull snorkel out of the water to do a physical or any sort of treatment we want her to be very comfortable with that so we try to make food we're pairing food with that touch to make it a positive experience for her so she's doing really well and we're happy to share her story with everyone that comes and visit us and we're really glad you guys could learn about snorkel today too Thank you, Taylor and Emma. It was so great getting to see Snorkel. So now we're going to talk about green sea turtles. So if you guys take a look right here, this is a green sea turtle carapace or shell. So their carapace is that outer shell right here. And if you look, the green sea turtles has a really beautiful carapace because they have striations of brown and green with some paler coloration too. So they have a much more streamlined shell or carapace than the loggerhead sea turtle. And they're still pretty big, so they can average to be about 350 pounds, and their carapace can get up to about three feet long, which is pretty long. But they're a little different from loggerheads because their heads are much smaller than the loggerheads who have those huge heads that we were talking about. Now, uh, green sea turtles are the most common nesting turtle here on Florida's beaches where we are. So their nesting season is from May to October, and you'll often find their nests. You can see stakes around their nesting sites on the beaches during those times. One really unique thing about green, green sea turtles is what they eat. As adults, they are pretty much the only turtle that eats a mainly herbivore diet. So they eat a lot of algae and seagrass, and they even get their name because they have a green patch of fat under their carapace or shell, so that's why they get the name green sea turtle. Now, they spend most of their days in the flats over by the seagrass beds, munching on seagrass and algae. But then at night, they go to their nighttime hideaways where they can rest over on rocky ledges, over by oyster beds, or even in coral reef areas too. The next turtle we're going to talk about is the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle. The Kemp's Ridley sea turtle gets its name from Richard Kemp's who helped discover the sea turtle. Now these guys are the rarest to see and they are the most endangered. They're also a pretty small species, so they average about 80 to 100 pounds. And we do have some Kemp's Ridleys here at the aquarium that you'll get to see in just a little bit in the exhibit behind me. Now these guys, one really interesting fact about them is that they have only one main nesting site and it's on a beach called Rancho Nuevo in the Gulf Coast of Mexico. So these were accidentally kind of discovered by film back in the 1940s. And the reason that someone caught it on film is they actually saw over 40,000 Kemp's Ridley sea turtles coming to nest on the beach all at one time in one day in broad daylight. They're the only species of sea turtle that nests in broad daylight. All the rest of them come to the beaches to nest at night and lay their eggs during the nighttime hours. But Kemp's Ridleys come during the day. Now, unfortunately, they are very threatened and their numbers have drastically decreased since then. So you'll no longer see them coming in such large hordes to the, such large hordes to the beach to nest. You may see smaller groups of them and their big nesting arrivals are called an arabata, which is coming from the Spanish word meaning arrival. So sadly, you can only witness this on film, but they are really cool animals. So we're gonna come take a look at over here in Mavis's rescue hideaway. Now that you guys have learned about Kemp's Ridley and green sea turtles, we're gonna come over here to Mavis's rescue hideaway where you guys might be able to see some of our friends in the exhibit. So two of the turtles you might see here today are Max and Rob, which are both Kemp's Ridley sea turtles. 
Max has been a resident at Clearwater Marine Aquarium since January 12, 1984, making him one of the first resident turtles at CMA. Max sustained a very severe head injury that unfortunately left him mostly blind, and as a result, he was unable to be released. Max has had to make adjustments to find his food and often takes a little longer than others to eat. He can see best out of his right eye and often circles to the right to see around his habitat. Max often lives with another Kemp's Ridley, Rob. They are often found sleeping together in their favorite spot. He is a more active sea turtle and often will be found cruising through the water while the other turtles take naps. His favorite source of enrichment is eating ice toys colored with food dye. Rob was found on September 3rd, 2001, and admitted to Clearwater Marine Aquarium. Rob, who was a juvenile at the time, weighed only 7 pounds and had a wound to both his upper and lower jaw on his right side. Although this was an old wound that was healed over, the rhombus on his top jaw was sliced all the way down to the bone. His injuries made him difficult to feed in the beginning, but things began to turn around when he began foraging on his own in mid-November. Rob had two minor surgeries in 2008 to ensure his jaw would heal entirely with no future problems. Today, Rob has come a long way from the seven pound little guy that stranded in 2001. Rob continues to have some difficulty catching his food and eating it easily, so he remains at the aquarium to ensure he gets a diet to fit his needs. Rob is a very easygoing turtle who loves his squid and spends most of his time napping. Rob shares an exhibit with another male of Kemp's Ridley, Max, who we just talked about. His favorite enrichment is finding different hideaways and shelters in his exhibit. Rob helps, keep guests better under, Rob helps guests better understand the, um, the impacts boats can have on marine life. It is important to obey, obey all boating regulations and look out for wildlife that we share with the waterways in order to decrease boat strike incidents with marine mammals. Now as we continue to look in here, you're going to see other turtles such as Stubby and Titus and Eula, but we'll keep an eye out for all of these turtles as we talk about some more of their stories. So this is also Mavis's rescue hideaway. So Mavis is in here too, but Mavis has another name and that is Harold. So Harold was found crawling on the beach in an overall healthy condition. However, when he was found, he had a fibropapilloma tumor on his neck. He was admitted into Clearwater Marine Aquarium on July 18, 2010. Surgery to remove the tumors was performed successfully. Harold recovered from surgery and no new tumor growth was noted. However, Harold was unable to find and forage for food on his own. He went to the University of Florida for further testing and it was discovered he had some neurological issues affecting his eyesight, meaning his his eyes can see, but the information is not getting processed. Because vision impairment would limit his ability to forage and avoid predators in the wild, <clears throat> Harold is not considered releasable. Harold then became a permanent resident at Clearwater Marine Aquarium. He is a busy turtle, often preferring to swim laps in the habitat while other turtles take naps. The next species we're going to talk about is a leatherback sea turtle. So sadly, we don't have any leatherback sea turtles here at Clearwater Marine Aquarium because they are so huge, so we'll talk about that in a little bit. But this is a replica of a leatherback skull. So you can see it is pretty big because these are really, really big animals. So we're going to show you a picture of a leatherback since we don't have one for you guys to look at while I tell you some facts about the leatherback sea turtles. Most leatherbacks average to be about six feet in length and they can weigh anywhere from 500 up to about 1,500 pounds. But the largest leatherback on record was almost 10 feet long and weighed over 2,000 pounds. That is so big. If you guys think about that, that's about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. So those are huge sea turtles. Leatherbacks look very different from other sea turtles. Instead of a shell covered with, shale, with scales or shields, leatherbacks are covered with a firm leathery skin, so that's how they get the name leatherback, and they have seven ridges running lengthwise down their backs. They are usually black with white, pink, and blue splotches and have no claws on their flippers, unlike a lot of the other sea turtles we've talked about today. Leatherbacks eat soft-bodied animals such as jellyfish, and their throat cavity and scissor-like jaws 
are lined with stiff spines that aid in swallowing this soft and slippery prey. Leatherbacks are capable of descending more than 3,000 feet, and they can travel more than 3,000 miles from their nesting beach. They are found throughout the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, as far north as Alaska and Labrador. Researchers have even found that leatherbacks are able to regulate their body temperature so that they can survive in cold waters. That's pretty unusual because sea turtles are all reptiles. We'll be talking more about what reptiles are in the next video, but that means that they're blooded and they rely on their environment to regulate their body temperature. The leatherback is found in Florida's coastal waters as well, and a small number, about 30 to 60 leatherbacks per year, nest in the state. Our last sea turtle that we're going to talk to you about today is the hawksbill sea turtle. The hawksbill, an example of a hawksbill sea turtle, is right here, and I'm going to tell you some cool facts about the hawksbill sea turtles. The hawksbill is a small, agile turtle whose beautiful tortoise-colored shell is its greatest liability. The shell is used in some European and Asian countries to make jewelry, hair decorations, and other ornaments, even though international trade in hawksbill products has been banned in much of the world. That's why a lot of jewelry gets the name tortoise shell. Hawksbills weigh from 100 to 200 pounds as adults and are approximately 30 in inches in shell length. Its carapace is shaded with black and brown markings on a background of amber. This, the shields of this kaleidoscope, kaleidoscopic armor overlap and the rear of the carapace is serrated. Its body is oval shaped, its head is narrow, and its raptor-like jaws give the hawksbill bill its name. These jaws are perfectly adapted for collecting its preferred food, sponges. Although sponges are composed of tiny glass-like needles, this poten potentially dangerous diet apparently causes the turtle no harm. Hawksbills are the most tropical of the sea turtles and are usually found in lagoons, reefs, bays, and estuaries of the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. They are frequently spotted by divers off the Florida Keys and a few nests are documented annually from the Keys to Canaveral National Seashore. All of the biofacts that you've seen here today, such as the skulls and carapaces, Clearwater Marine Aquarium is permitted to have these here for educational purposes. So they're not here for at-home use, but that is the reason we have them, to show you guys different things about all of these animals. Thank you guys so much for tuning in with us today. And now Taylor's going to explain our take-home activity for the day. It's always important to tie in our educational lesson with something fun. So today we're going to be making take-home sea turtle carapace capes. Now you may be wondering why we're making a carapace cape. Well, each of the different species of sea turtles have a unique pattern on their carapace or that top shell in the animal's body. And as biologists, we can identify the different kinds of sea turtles based on their scoot pattern. So today at home, you guys are gonna be able to make your own carapace cape utilizing the scoot pattern that we have here. Now I also have a real sea turtle shell or carapace. And as you guys can see, they also have those unique scoot patterns all down the sides. Now you can think about a scoot as a puzzle piece that makes up the whole carapace cape, for instance, for you. So what you're gonna do at home is get a large piece of paper and then draw whatever pattern you would like for your sea turtle. Remember, you're being unique, just like any other sea turtle. So you could create your cape however you want to. Once you've got it all decorated and colored in, go ahead and hole punch two holes Add a string and you have a wonderful carapace cape to go around being a loggerhead sea turtle or whichever one you choose all day long. See you later, everybody.